Hi, I'm Eddie Sunderji, and welcome to Your Finance TV's Crypto Revolution, covering all things crypto and digital assets. We're here with Adam Blumberg, co-founder of Interaxis. Adam, how are you? I'm doing great today, Matty. I hope you're doing well also. I'm feeling very chirpy and happy and excited. There's so much to talk about in the world of crypto, so yeah, I'm very, very happy. And before we get deep dive into it, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, and obviously feel free to drop us a line if you want us to talk about any topics in particular. So, Adam, you know, I feel like we would be remiss not to kick off with, you know, our friend Gary Ganser at the SEC. Uh, he's not winning any awards. So this time last week when we were recording, um, it feels like um, he was probably around or about to get in front of the House committee. It turns out he did do that, and he was getting grilled about the securitization of Pokemon cards. Uh, but um, it does feel like this guy, he, he's going to fight to the end. Um, or so, sorry, the, the institution of the SEC is going to fight to the end, but they are kind of getting a lot of pushback even from other lawmakers. So, you know, what do you do? We is this is this a little check mark in our box, or is this uh, you know just keep watching and seeing? I think it, it it's more just you know knocking away that bit of armor of the SEC that we've talked about for the, the beginning part of this year, Medi. We talked about how the SEC and so much of the the government regulators and, and legislators were just all over crypto and it looked really really bad until we had a few positive court decisions right we ripple which i know we'll talk about in a little while grayscale was a big one and so now you know kind of what we're seeing with chair gensler and and the uh which you're referring to as the house financial services committee um his his testimony in front of the house financial services committee he was he was getting grilled and it was a lot of in my opinion good questions uh obviously you know congress the the, the members of the house are going to do a slight bit of grandstanding there but it was questioning him on the same things they've been questioning about and and a lot of it goes towards overreach a lot of it goes towards the idea that he is essentially trying to make laws and i think congress is saying no 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 you don't make the laws you enforce some of them we make them and we don't like your interpretation of the laws that we made. And, and I think that has played a big part of it. And the interesting part, Mitty, is it's both sides of the aisle, right? It was We saw Tom Emmer just going at him. We, of course, have seen uh, Rep uh, McHenry go after him before, you know, just calling into question some of the enforcement actions, calling into question some of his comments in the past that are not congruous uh, with some of the actions that they're undertaking. And we saw Rep. Richie Torres, uh, who is a Democrat, right? Emmer and McHenry are both Republicans. Richie Torres is a Democrat who, you know, pretty famously went after Chair Gensler and, and asked him about Pokemon cards. Are Pokemon cards securities? And Chair Gensler said no. And he said, "What? A, well, apparently tokenized Pokemon cards would be. Uh, according to the rules that you put in place. And so what they're they're rightly saying is the enforcement actions, the new regulations you're trying to put out there, whether, whether it's custody rules or other securities rules, this huge blanket you're trying to throw over crypto is actually throwing a blanket over so many other assets that we've never considered securities. So if you're going to consider token securities, you're going to have to consider Pokemon cards. You're going to have to you know consider artwork. You're going to have to consider um, collectible shoes, all securities, if you're going to go with tokens, or we're going to have to make some new rules. And that's kind of what they're going after him with. And, and I keep using the words going after. They're doing their job, right? They're questioning someone who is, in, who is an unelected leader, who's an unelected regulator, and saying, we're the ones who are elected. What you're doing is not what we're hoping for. We need to enact some legislation. And the, the fact, Mehdi, that it's both sides of the aisle that are doing this makes it, it feel like there will be some legislation coming out of Congress in, in the next few years. And I say few years because next year, of course, is an election year, and that's pretty much all we're going to be talking about and all Congress is going to be talking about all next year. So does this mean my nine-year-old is going to have to go and take his Series 7 if he wants to advise people on trading uh, Pokemon cards in a tokenized way? <laughs> I it seems like your your nine year old would be. And look, I grew up trading baseball cards. I went to baseball card shows and such. I didn't see any SEC regulators there, right? And there were a whole bunch of uh, you know twenty and thirty somethings taking advantage of us kids, 
and you know telling us what we should and shouldn't buy and pricing things it seems like that that was pretty much equivalent of uh, new york stock exchange right this might be chair Genz's way on trying to get his hands on like a golden pikachu or something who knows uh, it's a sneaky roundabout way of doing it yeah. But uh, while we're talking about the SEC and uh, you know the, the 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 battle that's got ongoing, you mentioned the Ripple ruling um, earlier in your conversation, and you know that was a landmark case. The SEC did um, appeal that uh, ruling, um, and and it's been it's been overturned. It's been rejected. So you know this is a oh, this is definitely a check mark in in our box right but uh, you know what does this mean can they do anything else can they try anything else like how, how's it uh, are we going forwards or are we just sitting here stagnant uh, i i think we're relatively stagnant for the time being but we're not moving backwards right if, if the judge had allowed the sec to appeal what was a great a, a great ruling in in the eyes of crypto right this this ruling of uh, in, in the case of Ripple and XRP, that XRP was a security when it was first sold to these initial investors, but is no longer a security when it's listed on exchanges like Coinbase. That was pretty landmark. And that's what so many of the of the folks in the crypto world, whether it's Coinbase or Ripple or, or whomever else have been talking about, if the judge had allowed the SEC to appeal it and maybe, you know, which would, again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but maybe go towards overturning it. That would be a monster negative. That would be a huge setback. So I don't think this is a monster positive. I think it's a we're in the same place we were. So I'm going to take it as a little bit of a positive just because I like the glass half full or fuller. Um, so <laughs> let's move away from, you know, the, the, I guess this ultimately comes in the universe, like the macro picture and the the, the, the landscape of, of price action and such everyone's sitting here staring at their screens waiting for some sort of announcement to come on an approval on something or other but um while this is all going on it's nice to see that some of the big guys like ubs are continuing their development and absorption of the technology uh it seems like ubs asset managers moving into uh utilizing ethereum to pilot a tokenized money market fund um they had their in-house tokenization service and it's called ubs tokenized Great name, whoever thought of that one. And they're going to test it with various on-chain activities. So how is this all going to work? You know, this is obviously a very large asset manager that's starting to utilize this technology. Right. And it's interesting, of course. It seems like, Mehdi, we have one of these conversations every week now, right? Some huge bank or huge financial institution is starting to pilot or starting to utilize tokenizations. We've talked about it with Citi and JP Morgan and Deutsche and, and all those others. And now here we have UBS saying, we're going to take a money market fund. And in instead of, you know, maybe um, allowing people to trade it over some other sort of exchange, we're going to tokenize it such that it can be exchanged, it can be traded, I can sell it to you, you can sell it to me, uh, we can sell it back to UBS, whatever it is without having to go through some sort of exchange or some sort of intermediary, we're just going to use the Ethereum blockchain. Um, look, th this, this again, goes along with all these huge financial institutions and honestly, the financial world realizing this technology is going to make things faster, cut out intermediaries, more transparency, instant settlement, all the things that we like about blockchain technology. Why are we not going to go that direction? Of course, we need to go that direction. And the big boys realizing if we don't do it, someone else is going to and take our market share away from us. But 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 they're not necessarily, I don't think, doing it just to avoid getting market share taken. Their job is to figure out how to offer things like money market funds more efficiently. And imagine with, with what money market funds are, are probably yielding right now, if they can cut out a few basis points in, in terms of cost, and they can pass those on. Imagine how much more money they can make when we talk about the trillions of dollars probably tied up in money market funds if they just tokenize them. And then with, you know that goes even further, Medi. They did it on the Ethereum blockchain. So we have to start talking about, okay, what does this mean for Ethereum? If a company like UBS is going to be offering, tokenizing, and exchanging their money market fund over the Ethereum blockchain, well, that means that there's going to be more demand to utilize that chain and possibly the value of ETH goes up. That's how we should also be reading this, right? Is this should go to the fundamental value of ETH as well. So Adam, just for my own clarification, you just said, you know, you and I could trade, uh, so I could sell you my uh, access to my money market fund via this chain. Now, 
this is disintermediating the broker dealer effectively the ironic part is obviously ubs asset management is the one doing this but ubs itself is a broker dealer so this is kind of like cutting their own lunch right well the important thing to note many and a lot of people say you know this is everyone's just going to be able to trade everything we can wrap though you can take those tokens and actually write rules into them right they're smart contracts which means they're computer code and some of that code might be you can't go i can't go exchange this with you on a peer-to-peer basis unless we're within the confines of the ubs system or something like that and so it might not be what i what i was saying where it could be true 100 percent peer-to-peer what it might do for UBS is again have the, these degrees of transparency and instant settlement, but it's it might not be like PayPal did with their stablecoin that said we're going to issue this stablecoin, but you can go trade it anywhere else you want to. You don't have to go through us. I'm guessing UBS is going to put a few walls around it such that you can only utilize this within their garden, but it still it, it still moves it propels us a little bit forward. To where maybe at some point they go, we're going to issue this. We're going to figure out how to make money by issuing these money market tokens. We're going to hold the assets, right? And, and right now they're they're earning what four and a half, five percent, something like that. And we don't care if if Adam and Mitty trade them wallet to wallet because we are holding the assets that represent those tokens, and we're earning five percent on them. So trade them all you want; doesn't matter to us. It's a beautiful thing. It's uh, it's right. definitely bringing efficiency to it. Right. And, and that's part of the disintermediation, right? Is it's it's not like we're going to go around banks and their bank and therefore banks are just going to get, throw their hands up and go, we give up, right? This technology beat us. They're going to figure out ways to to make their money. It's going to be new revenue streams, it's going to be new business models. And they might be looking to companies like Circle that are just issuing USDC and they get a dollar for every USDC they issue, and they get to go invest that dollar and earn four and a half, five percent risk free right, on the billions of USDC that's issued. So UBS and all the others are going, why wouldn't we do that, right? We don't care if you trade UBS money market somewhere else. We don't need to have it in a, in a walled garden. Go trade it if you want to. We're the ones that are earning 5% on your on the dollar while it's sitting here. Keep clipping that coupon. Yep. So um, back to ETF world, right? So um, I saw Valkyrie had... Uh, uh, it has, so Valkyrie had their uh, Bitcoin strategy ETF, right? And they've now added uh, an Ether's future. They've got Ether's, Ether futures exposure added into that ETF. I think it's been renamed now uh, Bitcoin and Ether strategy ETF. Um, is, are they the only ones doing this or is this, uh, this is now becoming more commonplace? Because it seems like a good way of getting exposure towards it for these, these ETFs now. No, but... Um, in lieu yeah, of waiting for right. some decision to be made. <laughs> right. So as soon as the ETH futures ETF were allowed, ETFs were allowed, of course, I, I think it was like six or seven companies who started offering Ether uh, ETF futures. And Valkyrie and Bitwise decided, well, as long as we can have ETH futures, why don't we create an ETF that is 50-50 Bitcoin and ETH futures, right? So both Valkyrie and Bitwise and, and maybe some others, but those are the two that, that I know of, have a 50-50 Bitcoin ETH futures ETF. So it's giving people exposure to both in a, in a 50-50 ratio. And I apologize. I don't know exactly how often they're going to go rebalance that to get back to that 50-50. Um, but I do know it's an interesting strategy because when, you know, when advisor a- ask me, what, you know, what should my clients be, what tokens, my response, again, not being not giving financial advice, is if you want to be relatively safe in the crypto world, Bitcoin and ETH. Like that's it. Go. I'd like if it were me, if I had the money, I'd go 50-50. A, and this is exactly what Bitwise and Valkyrie are doing. And it's something they haven't had the opportunity to do before in an ETF. And now they do via the futures route. Of course, they would rather go the spot route, but and, and as soon as a Bitcoin spot gets approved and an ETH spot gets approved, they'll likely do the same thing. They'll probably shut down these future funds. That makes sense. They'll probably like either the, you know, convert them like the trust that like Grayscale wants to do the conversion of their trust into an ETF, spot ETF. So we'll see how all that goes, but it's a good you know, stop gap, I guess, until we get some sort of approval for a, a cash ETF. So, Adam, something I know that's near and dear to your heart and we've discussed many, many times over the last several years, um, connecting that universe or closing that gap between the digital world and, you know, in real life or, as the kids say, IRL, 
of learning these things. Um, so IYK is being funded by our friends at A16Z, um, and there's a the, you know they're kicking off with some of these new brands or A16Z. I know you're going to say it. Um, you know, including you know Adidas, and I think you've also ma- mentioned Adidas along the way as well. So, what's the latest on this whole project? Yeah, this is a, a great use. So they uh, IYK, you know, raised a bunch of money. They had gone through the uh, A sixteen Z startup school, uh, then they raised a whole bunch of money from them and, and other investors. And basically, the idea is how can we take physical products and embed something in them to where we can also give some sort of non-fungible token, something that can be tracked in a wallet. And it's not because they're trying to track where you are at any one moment, but it's you bought this product and we are going to utilize non-fungible tokens or, or NFT technology to, to be able to do things like, you know, give you rewards or uh, give you tickets or, or somehow be able to uh, keep you within our, our world, keep you within our sphere, right? And that's where I think you and I have, have talked quite a bit about where NFT technology can go. It can be this um, this link between the, the purchaser and the, the company that produces the product, right? So such that we've talked about it with loyalty rewards with airlines. We've, we've talked about it with Starbucks and Nike, and now Adidas is getting on. There's, there are several, um, I know, record labels or or those kinds of company, music type companies, creator type companies that are getting involved with this company IYK, and they're figuring out how we're going to bring the physical and the digital together. I think they call it digital, which is a uh, I I can't continue to use that word, and I hope they stop it. I hope they come up with a different word for that, but they're they're calling it digital, um, which, which is which is horrible. It, it reminds me of something like Benefer or something. Oh, wow. it, it just hurts my my mouth to actually say that, but that's kind of what it's being called. But they've obviously raised a tremendous amount of money. And, and again, the realization that non-fungible tokens is not just about pictures of monkeys and things like that. I know we talked about it last week, pudgy penguins uh, and how they're they're taking what's happening, you know, on chain and and what's happening with these protocols and with these projects and bring them to, to real world. And so this is kind of going the opposite way, right? Is saying, we already have products. We already have hats and, and shoes and clothes. We already have records. We already have music. How can we take that into the digital world and the non-fungible token world such that if Adam buys a hat, then the company can can kind of reward me. The company can say, look, we, we know you bought this hat for this particular team. We're going to give you, you know, tickets or or we're going to give you a discount or something like that. It, it's a way to kind of track what's going on without it being uh, and it, and it can all be, you know, kind of on a on a public transparent blockchain. It's just a better way to track things. We talked earlier about UBS and those companies realizing there's a better way to track some of some of these uh securities that they offer. There's a better way to track users, uh, purchasers, anything like that. And that's non-fungible tokens on a public blockchain because there's going to be so much more they're going to be able to do with it rather than keeping it in their own database. So, Adam, this is all super exciting, right? And I I, I see all this as a massive positive for the the broad industry and and the whole adoption of digital assets in, in different ways and forms. My question to you is, and this is completely off the cuff, I was just sitting here thinking, listening to it, that it, it feels like it's still quite, it's a, still a very niche market, especially in this NFT world. What type of demographic do you, and I'm, I'm not asking you to to throw out numbers or anything, but what, what sort of demographic do you think is kind of really the main participant in this? Because to me, I see, I don't think it's the too young because they don't have necessarily access to, to, to be able to get to this type of stuff, even though I know my 12-year-old and my nine-year-old would love to get involved, but they're not yet. I see it more as like 16, 18 to like 30, kind of being that sweet spot for this early adoption phase in, in this technology utilization between you know the digital and, and in real life side of things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. I think it's around the time that that it, the earliest would be around the t- same time people would have a bank account, yeah. right? Like you're 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 probably not letting your kids get too much into having accounts online or anything like that. So you're probably not going to allow them to have a wallet that they totally control, you know, a, a crypto based or blockchain based wallet that they totally control. Now, keep in mind, many of these products are going to have some sort of NFT relatability, whether you want to use it or not. 
right? When you buy the hat or the shoes or the record or something like that, it's going to have some sort of NFT tie-in, whether you care to use it or not. Now, those and whether or not people are going to buy it because of that, I seriously doubt it. Maybe a few DGENs will, but for the most part, people aren't. I think you're right. I think it's going to be like the 16 to 30 year old, the people who are comfortable with the technology, who are going to get the hat, get the shoes, get the jacket, try it out a little bit, get a wallet, maybe see what happens with this NFT and are willing to try out that technology. Probably the same as you and I were in kind of early days of the internet. We were we were younger and willing to try things out. And that's probably going to be the same demographic. Again, I'm, I'm not a marketing expert, but it seems to me like that would make sense. You're probably not looking at the 50 year olds that are going to get a hat and go, man, I can't wait to put the NFT that represents that hat in my wallet. Well, and, and you know, obviously after, you know, gen, and, and this is very generalized, right? You know, once you're 30, 40, you know, 50, you've suddenly got family, you've got kids, wife, and, and, you know, your wife might not necessarily be as keen about you buying Pokemon card NFTs or these types of things anyway, just to try the technology out. But my point is that, it feels like this is a generational mental investment in in going forwards with this technology and adoption, right? So we are definitely in the first and second innings of this whole thing. And if you know, and, and the point that I kind of tell people is, we see this fl- fluctuation. We see the excitement that comes with some of the price moves in some of these coins in Bitcoin at times, Ethereum, and that's you know that's all going to happen, you know, with ETFs or whatever it is, right? And we see the excitement with some of these uh, NFTs and the coins, you know, where it's eight coin that goes along with it, any of these types of things, but kind of need to take a step back and realize this is just a short game. There's a, there's a much bigger picture about this broad adoption of this technology, which is kind of the, the, the bigger picture and the final game of this, you know, let's look in 15, 20, 25, 30 years where the 16 year old is now has been doing it for 15 years and he's now in his 30s and his whole life is digital based right his whole financial world is defi and he's you know he's going around he'll buy his papa soup from the the vendor around the street using eth or whatever coin it might bitcoin whatever it is right but it'll just become second nature rather than, oh, wow, this guy bought pizza with Bitcoin. You know, it won't be a headline. And, and that's kind of where I feel we all kind of want this to go. And I'm just trying to gauge the perspective of the timeline that comes with this. So, yeah, yeah it, it's the, it, and you're exactly right. And I always talk about it in, in parallel to the internet, right? The, the, growth of the internet started after we had a huge market crash when everything was speculation. And then we started actually building the internet and the growth of the internet became not about stock prices, right? It became about how we're going to actually be able to communicate with each other wherever we are in the world and how we're going to get information out. And we created totally new business models out of it that we didn't think about back in 99 and 2000. It's, you know, in 99, very few people were like, man, I really could use an application that allows me to send 280 characters to people who somewhat follow me. And by the way, that's going to change the way news is delivered. That that wasn't on someone's mind. I don't think. Maybe it was on someone's mind. It wasn't on mine at the time. But lo and behold, Twitter seems to have done relatively well. So I, I think we, we're getting to that point. As you said, we're kind of in the first and second innings. We're experimenting with things. The difference we have now, Medi, on the good and the bad side is we already have the internet. So when there are when there are huge successes or even moderate successes, it gets it gets totally overblown and exacerbated. The same with huge negative news, right? We you and I have expressly started not talking about SBF and his trial, but that's huge news, right? The FTX downfall is monster news that we can't seem to get away from. So whenever if if like IYK doesn't work out, right? When NFT projects that the news last week was NFTs are down 95% or something like that, that's huge news. But the experimentation is important. We have to experiment and we have to have those ups and downs to get to where we go. We totally understand how to use this technology, or we understand a little bit and we're going to iterate through it. Remember that in, in my mind, this is evolutionary technology, not revolutionary, right? We're this is just an evolution of the internet. And and it 
it just makes sense that we're going to have to step through it. There are people in the crypto and DeFi world that just want this flip. All of a sudden, I want everything decentralized. I want everything operating on Bitcoin and ETH. And that's just not going to happen. It, it just it can't happen in a flip like that. It's an eventual move that direction to where, again, those kids, your kids, my kid, they're just going to know how to use it all. It's going to be second nature. And they're not going to go, man, I remember when we switched from using banks to using you know, wallets on my phone. They're just going to use it. And, and they're not going to think twice about it. Well, Adam, I think we can end this in a better spot than evolutionary, not revolutionary, on the crypto revolution. Right. Okay, we should call it the crypto evolution. Adam, as always, thank you so much for your time. And uh, if anyone wants to find out more about Adam's course on digital assets and crypto education, I would urge you to go check out interaccess.io. The link is below there. And until next time, thank you for watching and good luck investing.